Welcome to the King Speed Podcast. I am James Ham, your King's Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. Joining me, Mr. Brendan Nunez. Brendan, of course, from the King's Pulse Podcast and the King's Herald. What's going on, Brendan? Not too much, James. Another day in the life. We're officially in the off season. You know, I think those exit interviews still felt like the end of last year. And now we're uh, officially off season. Get to watch some playing games and, you know, dream about what if that was the Kings feeling that. Yeah, I don't even like venture down that road ever because it's been so long and because it's I've covered this team so long. It is dark. It's it's a dark place, Brendan. It's dark. Um, okay, so let's let's just hit the the little bits of information we have to go through over. Um, number one, if you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe. If you're listening on any other platform, give us a rating and review. Uh, the better, the more reviews and ratings we get, the better. Um, see, outside of that, the Kings Beat, uh, make sure to jump on for a subscription. And a premium subscription gets you um, a bunch of uh, gated content that's coming, as well as uh, access to the happy hour and a few other things. So um, all of that is cool. Um, so make sure you jump on with the King's Beat. Um, and the happy hour. Uh, we're going to set the happy hour for um, next Thursday. Um, I think is today the 14th, Brennan. I'm not good at dates anymore. It is, James. Okay, so Thursday, April 21st, we're going to do episode 5 of the King's Beat. And we don't have a crafty name for it yet because um, I'm still waiting for confirmation for a guest. Um, but we will have a, a cool guest. And uh, it should be fun, and hopefully we don't have to move the date to, to coincide with a guest's availability, but we should be okay. Um, so I'm going to, like, preliminary set episode five of Off the Record with the King's Beat Virtual Happy Hour for, uh, for Thursday, April 21st from 530 to 730, and we'll go from there. Um, again, if we have to make an adjustment, uh, I'll let you guys know as soon as possible. Again, that is only for premium subscribers, and it is a really cool, cool situation where we basically bring in a guest, and uh, we have a few drinks, and we sit here and riff about um, all kinds of stories, off-the-record stuff, uh, wild stories from the road. Um, we've had some great stuff, you know, uh, Jerry Reynolds talking about, you know, working a garbage truck with Larry Bird and... Um, there's all kinds of cool stuff, right, Brennan? You, you've had a good time on those? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's a fun peek for some of the listeners into the conversations that, I don't know, I've got to have a little bit in a way behind the scenes this year with you and so many of the other great people that cover the team or are involved in whatever way. And I've heard some of the potential candidates for this upcoming one, and it's not one that anyone's going to want to miss. Uh, you're not going to want to miss it. Yeah. So no, it's a lot of fun. And, and, uh, it's, you know, a minimum commitment to the King's beat. It's uh, slightly more than one tank, one gallon of gas, not a tank of gas. Maybe a year subscription is close to a tank of gas at this point. Uh, but Brennan just took a trip to Southern California and realized that driving is no bueno anymore. Yeah. Gas is not a conversation I want to have at this point, James. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you like wanted to stop by and just like trade in your car for a Tesla. Yeah, yeah. Out my window, I can see a gas station, and I can see the gas prices constantly fluctuating. And I generally choose to ignore it, but sometimes I have to pay attention. It's not happy days. It fluctuates throughout the day, right? You know, I haven't seen them switching it, but I'm going to pay more <laughs> attention now. Yeah, I'll that's get back awesome. To you. You should, uh, okay, so Brennan is going to try to do timestamps today where uh, when we say something crazy that he's going to mark it and then we'll, we'll do some timestamps for the, for the pod. But um, I think we should also, like, he should timestamp the, uh, the gas prices out the window of his house. Like at noon, it is 569.9 cents per gallon. It's gone up at 4.35 with the 5 o'clock rush coming in. I'll just to... set up a camera and time lapse. and Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> like, you see the guy go out there and, like, change the buttons. Like, <laughs> yeah. I definitely uh, get some loud arguments at the gas station for sure. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't think, like, yeah, that's kind of an interesting place to live by. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, let's get to this, Brendan. Um, we've decided we're going to uh, – we started last week with Dante DiVincenzo, um, but we're going to go through and kind of break down uh, each of the Kings that 
I think we're going to break down long-term kings. We're we're going to break down guys that either will be here. Um, well, I guess we can't really break down long-term kings because the only one who's under contract long-term with the kings at this point is De'Aaron Fox and maybe Davion Mitchell and Sabonis, if you want to call two years long-term. No one else on the roster is, is under contract longer than that, um, except for Rashawn Holmes, which I don't think any of us expect him to be here um, next season by one way or another. Um, so we're starting with a 90-minute conversation on Chemezi Metu. Chemezi Metu. We're going to have a Metu moment. Uh, yeah, no, we're not touching uh, base on Chemezi Metu quite yet. I mean, I think there could come a point where we have like sort of a like groups of players for like the like deeper when we get deeper into this. Um, so we could break down like say Metu Lyles and damian jones on one podcast or something um but we're uh you know again we started last week dante with dante divincenzo um and uh huge i mean that podcast went big because uh we broke a little bit of news in there that dante divincenzo's people aren't happy um and also uh brendan this is cool uh the sports business journal which is a huge national publication um like they listed our podcast as one of the podcasts to listen to um, this week because of, uh, because of the Dante DiVincenzo podcast and sort of, I think also the breakdown of Avec Rana Dive. Um, so yeah, so we made it, Brennan, we made it. We made it, yes. made yes. it, James. I think you made it a while ago, but I made it. Made it. <laughs> made it. Awesome. We're here. Is this what this feels like? <laughs> this is, this is what it feels like. <laughs> it, it feels like gas is still 569 a gallon yeah. right out your window. Oh my God. He's out there right now. James. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you're not, uh, if you're not laughing, you're crying at this point. Um, uh, it's just kind of the way the world is. Um, so look, uh, I think one of the guys that we want to start with, um, and for good reason, um, is Mr. De'Aaron Fox. And, uh, so we're going to take a deep dive into De'Aaron Fox, uh, today. And, um, I'll say this, Brendan, I've covered this team for a long time and I don't ever remember talking about a player's psyche more than we did this year with De'Aaron Fox. Um, you know, I, I broke down some of this uh, stuff on either the pod or on the radio. We've discussed it. Um, when it really comes down to it, like De'Aaron Fox is an introvert and people want him to be an extrovert and he struggles to be an extrovert. And um, when people who are extroverts uh, come around – um, he tends to sort of take a back seat to those people a and not overall, but like as far as his voice in the room. And that's a classic, uh, trait of a lot of introverts that, that they do like for other people to sort of be out in front of it. And they're more comfortable sort of being on the back burner and, and watching and listening. And when they do say things, it's usually pretty profound, um, and it, it's sort of an interesting way to cover a player because I don't remember, again, maybe with DeMarcus Cousins, we, you know, we broke down his psyche on occasion, um, but not like I feel like we did with De'Aaron Fox this year, especially with a lot of people calling him out for not being the leader they thought he should be. And um, I think the where I'll start with is like expectations about who he should be and all that stuff. I think we have to reevaluate what that might be. Um, yeah, what do you mean by that? As a player or? No, uh, no, I think as like people want him to be something that I'm not sure he can be. Totally. I felt like that was the case for most of this season, um, especially the beginning of it. Like there's just different leadership styles. And Fox said at some point that, you know, there was a change when the trade happened. Um, mm -hmm. Fox said at some point that he was more of a lead by example guy. And that when Ty left, that he took up more of a vocal leadership role and kind of is something that he wants to grow throughout this offseason and take into next year and improve in that way. But I'm with you. I think it's just like a personality thing. Like you don't have to be – to be the best player on the team, you don't have to be this outgoing vocal leader. Yeah, you don't have to be a raw rock guy. You don't. I, I mean, that's not the way that everyone leads. And – I'll say this, like when, um, 
like when the trade happened, we did see a change, but I saw the change in Fox, like coming into a second season where all of a sudden, like everyone in the gym is like, oh my gosh, like we've got something here. Like this kid is incredible. And he was, uh, he was more forceful. He was more demanding of his teammates. And I kind of feel like as the Kings added veterans around him, that he got quieter. And then when they added a guy like Ty, who Ty is, you know, Ty's not, I don't think he's what you would consider noisy. Like Buddy Heald is what I consider noisy. Um, and, and again, that's not a dig on Buddy. That's just his personality. His personality is to be like bubbly and chatty and, um, and like he doesn't shut up. Yeah. So he's, he's noisy. Um, but I think Ty is one of those guys who just steps in and it, he's such a natural fit. He's so good with the media. Although I'll even tell you, like, he goes on so many podcasts and stuff, uh, Ty does, that on occasion he says things that just make you, like, look at him like, okay, I'm not sure that, like, I love Ty, but when he literally says, well, that's kind of the, the answer I would give to the media, then it's like, oh, so you're just telling us that, yeah, you're just faking it a lot of those times. And De'Aaron Fox can't fake it. He can't fake it, right? That's I, I think that's the problem that we have. It's that he wears it on a sleeve. He's pissed when they lose. He's pissed when things are spinning out. He can't, you know, on occasion we get these these moments of introspect. And then other times, uh, you know, when things are going well, um, he's jovial. Even when, you know, like the typical thing is when you, you have this huge breakout game and you lose, um, players are usually like, you know... Uh, it just it doesn't really matter because it wasn't in a win. I, I never got that from Fox either. It's like, yeah, that was a good game. Like, I, I wish we would have won. But, you know, I, I played well, and it was good to get one of those big games. And, yeah, he's a he's an interesting guy to cover. He definitely is. And, you know, I want to ask you, like, how was he the beginning of or the end of last season compared to coming into this year? Because I, I would imagine that a lot of the beginning of this season was – Buddy and Marvin still being around and maybe there was uncertainty with Luke and he just came into a situation with guys that didn't want to be there and it was almost like he had just gotten beaten down by a tough environment it seemed like um, but how was he at the end of last season you know I thought that he he walked into the off season in an okay state but you have to remember uh, if I'm not mistaken um, that like this season, Fox missed the the last um, the last grouping of games, and I believe he had COVID on you know, so we didn't get him. He missed the last thirteen games. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't get him. And again, it was kind of like this year where if they really needed him to play at some point, there would have been a possibility for him to come back. Um, it, I think. Well, uh, I'll say this like. I'm pretty sure he got COVID pretty good. Like he was in, uh, he, he wasn't in great shape and it took him a long time to clear protocol. Um, so yeah, I, you know, look, I, I think that there's a different vibe again when you've missed a bunch of games and then you're doing like a postseason because we did get him like, like we did this year, uh, where he did talk to us for a few minutes. I think it was via zoom. Um, he came back in the building after clearing COVID and, and, and talked, um, yeah, I think that there was like a positive, Hey, let's get this thing rolling. Let's, let's build this thing, build this thing out. We made some nice trades. Uh, you know, we're excited about next year. I, I thought it was a little different. I thought this year, um, you know, I think he was in a good space, like at the end of the season, like he knows where they're going. He knows what their build is. And, and we got a pretty good understanding of what he thinks should happen here. Totally. Yeah. I, I think that it was definitely interesting to me to kind of witness the change because the beginning of the year, Fox was kind of intimidating, at least because I think I'm just being new to it. It was like Fox almost gave off like a what in my mind is like Popovich, where if you ask a question a certain way, he'll answer it with two words if he can. And he kind of broke out of that as the year went on, and well, specifically when they made the trade for Sabonis and DiVincenzo, the whole deadline. Um, 
do you want to kind of touch on like what were your thoughts? Because a lot of people got on him for, I guess, like the attitude that he had earlier in the year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like I think that? I think a good way to uh, to intro that, Brennan. Let's let's run the clip of him at the end of the season, um, because I I think it does play into the the greater picture of De'Aaron Fox for this season. So I'm hoping the audio is uh, loud enough for you guys out there. But we're gonna run a clip here. Um, it's a minute nine, and uh, me and Brennan will be right back, and and we'll dive into what he says here because it it goes back to what he said earlier in the season. There was a moment where he had a similar take earlier in the season. Um, I mean, I think pretty much going into every season, it's always been you know, important for me to, uh, to win. I mean, I think it's important to everybody. Um, it's definitely been, uh, definitely been difficult, I would say, um, you know, kind of coming into the situation. But like, you felt, like I've always said, um, you want to be a part of that that team that kind of turns it around, um, and that's that's never changed. Uh, I want to be a winner at the end of the day. You know, uh, that's how I go into every game, uh, into every season. You know, trying to win every single game that we that I that I step my foot on the court, and um, I wouldn't say it's like more important than you know any other season, but you know, going into it, you just want to you don't want to lose. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you you're not trying to lose and. Um, it's a difficult thing, and it's, and it's hard to do. It's definitely hard to do in the NBA, and it's hard to try to turn a team and a franchise around, but um, it's something that I'm willing to, you know, put the work in um, to change. And I think if you change that here, it's, it's it's not like changing it anywhere else, truthfully. Yeah, it's a good clip. And, and again, I, I think it really does go back to the conversation we had with him early in the season. We had a few moments where it was hard to communicate with him where he didn't want to talk and, or we almost had to get like philosophical with him and to try, try to drag something out of him. And I remember he had the moment early in the season where he truly kind of broke down a bit and and said something similar to this, but like, like it was the line that, you know, I've never lost like my whole life. I've never lost. And all of a sudden I'm faced with like loss after loss after loss and uh, I'm going to say this, like, like we talk about this and we talked about it in general and, and stuff like that. But I think coming into this season that Fox did not like how the offseason went. He was OK with some of the additions and some of that stuff. But the way he looked at the upcoming season was that they didn't do enough and that everything was on him. And that if this team had any shot at all, that he had to be like so far above what he had been in the past. He had to come in and instantly average 28, 29, 30 points a game for this team to have a shot. And I think he also looked around the room room and saw major deterrence for him to be successful. And those major deterrence, number one, was Buddy Heald. Number two was Marvin Bagley because... Those guys, like, again, I'm not trying to beat on those guys. I'm just trying to tell you the psyche that I saw. It's that those guys didn't want to be there. And if you're someone who, who's being asked to put an entire franchise on your back and carry it up a, a gigantic hill, the last thing you want to do is have two guys at the end of the rope just sitting down and you got to drag them up the hill. You need everybody trying to support you and push you up the hill and try to get you uh, get you and, and your group up to the finish line. And those guys were clearly, they did not want to be here. And I think that Fox, it got in his head. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll break down his numbers, but the numbers early in the season weren't good at all. Like, Fox didn't look like himself. At first, I thought... Okay, he looks like he's he's gained a ton of mass. I'm not even sure if it was mass at this point. I'm not. I'm not sure that it was like defined muscle and he was in the best shape of his life coming into camp. We've heard things like he was 15 pounds out of shape. I don't know that that's the case either. And guys like De'Aaron Fox, I, it, he came into the into the season at 23 years old. They literally can get in shape in like a week. 
where, you know, like someone like myself, that's not going to happen. <laughs> a week ain't going to cut it. I'm going to need like, like six weeks. And the whole time I'm going to be like in a tub, like ice bath the whole time. Fox is different. He's, you know, a lean muscle guy. He's a, a, a wiry guy. He can get in shape super fast. He can burn fat super fast. If he was out of shape, he can lose all of that so quickly in a couple of practices because, you know, he does exert himself and all that stuff. So I just think that like mentally he wasn't ready for this season and it started out bad for him and he allowed that to sort of set the stage for what would happen next. And it also opened the door for guys like Ty to step in and become like really the de facto leader of the team. And it was because... I don't think he was in the right mental space to open the season, and that's not how we close the season. I think to close the season, we saw the player that we hope that we'll see to begin next season. But does that make sense? Definitely, and I think the you know being unsatisfied with the off season, I think, is something that probably most of the fan base shares that feeling. It was I thought a pretty underwhelming off season, and like you're saying, he he started slow his first ten games. He's you know, 18 and six, but the issue is 39% from the field, 18% from three. He's, it seemed like there was a struggle at the beginning of the year with not just him, but a lot of top scorers with um, a very big difference in the amount of whistles that players were seeing, which was something that De'Aaron really, that's where he found some consistency in his game, even if maybe we wanted to see some growth with his free throw percentage in the year prior, which it did go up a bit this year, by the way. Um, a, a little bit. There was some progress there throughout the course of the whole season. But, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, those first, like they were winning despite him at the beginning of the year in that tough schedule, that five and four in those first nine games. That's while De'Aaron, again, is shooting 39% from the field, 18% from three. So then the conversation switches to, um, like I said, winning despite him. And he's kind of getting some blame of when is he going to turn it on and, I could see why it's frustrating of like these other guys don't want to be here and all of a sudden I'm the one that's getting slack and I I do think the adjustment of Tyrese was a really big thing like Tyrese came into his own this season and you know we had that Chris Haynes piece at one point in the season of De'Aaron saying that um, now he gets to be more of a score first guy which I don't think is him saying that he doesn't want to be somebody that's passing or anything. I think that's just a, like, I'm adjusting to playing alongside Tyrese. And you saw a lot of, like, your turn, my turn of – he just didn't look comfortable on the floor also, you know. So I, I think on top of the Buddy and, and Bagley situation and a coaching change that happened pretty quick, which, again, he pointed out to us in media, that's the first time he's dealt with a coaching change midseason, um, but also adjusting alongside Tyrese – and the change in whistle that we experienced a little bit at the beginning of the year. Like, it's just a complicated season. And, you know, Darren isn't going to use that as an excuse. Like, he told us that the quote is, I wouldn't say I had a good season. I think I had a good stretch before I got hurt. But that's pretty much all it is. Before those, I guess, last 20 games, I don't feel like I played even close to my ability. Um so it's not an excuse or anything, but I think there were a lot of complications with this season. Yeah, it is a complicated season because we can go back. Um, I asked him after like four or five games. Uh, actually, I'm going to say something before I get into that. Um, we get to the, like, the Kings were, what, five and five? Um, like, and they looked like they were going to be solid. And they actually, I think they were five and three at one point, something. They were above 500. Right and yeah, five and four, nine games. Okay, uh, five and four. Okay, so here's the problem that I saw with the those games. Um, it, it's when you're watching a game and you see a team like hit eleven three pointers in the first half, right? And you can just look and go, okay, well that's not sustainable. Like, you know, the Kings hit if they hit eleven three pointers, that means that Chemezi Metu hit two or three. It means that Justin Holiday hit two or three. Um, or Harrison Barnes meant, had a career high of eight in one of those games. Well, yeah, but see, that's the point I'm making. Harrison Barnes was doing something in the first nine games of the season that was exciting, and everyone's like, oh, my gosh, look what he's doing. We should have looked at it just like we did a, a wild first half of hitting three-point shots. It was something that was unsustainable. 
and he was carrying the team through that and he was waiting for De'Aaron Fox to catch up to get in the right mind frame and to start succeeding and then Harrison hurt his foot and couldn't be the same guy again um it I, I think he came back a little early and I think he was probably uh that wore on him more than he wanted to acknowledge um but I also think that the way that we saw the early season with Ty stepping up and you know other people stepping up that Fox almost like it wasn't like oh, I don't need to be that guy. It was more or less, well, they're they're going to take over right now, and I'm going to try to get in my right space. And we talked to him about chemistry early in the season. We talked to Ty about chemistry early in the season. They kept saying that they had their chemistry was fine, that they love each other, that they hang out off the court and everything else. And I totally get it. They looked like they were buddies. They did not look like they were fitting together. It looked like you know, square peg, round hole, just kept like jamming. And we're like, when is this thing going to figure itself out? And, you know, if you give them two or three years, I think they would have figured it out. But that's not the way things happen in Sacramento. Like people hit the the nitro button all the time. Like, oh, it's got, we got to fix it now. We got to fix it now. They look like they both were trying to make each other comfortable. And at one point I was like, I, I think they both just need to at least De'Aaron, like just say I'm going to do this, you know, say that I'm going to take over right now um, and just go get your own because there, it seemed to me like a lot of trying to make the other person comfortable and figuring out what was going to work for them. And in that process, I think they lost a little bit of like what their ideal version of themselves is primarily De'Aaron. Yeah. And I'll say this too, like it, the different personality types, I think that played into it, you know, like, Halliburton didn't want to step on De'Aaron's toes. He already knew that he was taking over sort of the leadership role, but the best player role is still De'Aaron's. And then, you know, like clearly Fox is okay with with Ty being more vocal, but, you know, he still wants to do his stuff on the court. Like, it just felt awkward, right? And and again, I think they would have figured it out. Like, I, I've said this a bunch of times. Like, go back and look at, CJ McCollum in his first, second, third season, he wasn't very good. Like everyone talked about how good he was like right off the bat. No, he wasn't. It took him and Damian Lillard Lillard, a couple of years to figure it out. And I think that if we would have got to the end of this season, we would have got to the end of next season, we would have started to see Fox and Halliburton be one of the better backcourts in basketball. But like that, I still agree with the trade. I still think it was a trade that made the Kings better initially, but it also took all of this, what we're talking about here, this weird chemistry, this weird whatever, it just took it away because the second you put Sabonis with Fox, you saw the chemistry. It was like we didn't know what we were seeing, what was wrong, until you see what was right. And now you're like, oh, now I get it. That's what... That's what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like two guys who are just absolutely making each other better every single time they're on the court together. And we never saw it with Ty and, and De'Aaron, except for in small bursts. I mean, what was their stat? They, like, 40 games, 45 games in the season, they hadn't both scored 20 in a game, right? It was something, I something so. crazy. I think the first time they did was in Atlanta, if I'm remembering that right. Yeah, um, it took forever for them both to score 20 in a game, which isn't a big deal. That's, I mean, that's one of those weird stats that we just throw at you as if it means something. Oh, they haven't scored 20 in a game. They did score 18 and 36 in like five games, but they <laughs> didn't get to 20. They, that matters. 20 matters. It does not matter at all. Um, but It, it I was still... eye-opening, though, that when Domas came, it clicked instantly. I forget who instantly. said it in the, in the pressers, the exit interviews, but it was like you thought there would be a little bit of a growing process. Like, no, it works right away they played 15 games together De'Aaron averaged 28.9 6.8 assists um, on 50 percent from the field 36 percent from three yeah that's pretty good it's not bad I'll tell you I had someone within the organization tell me very specifically when we traded for DeMontis Sabonis we traded for two all-stars and I'm like because I'm like well Trey Lyles ain't an all-star like I like Trey Lyles but Josh Jackson (laughs) I like Dante DiVincenzo, but he ain't an all-star. Um, 
but the point was that that not only was Domas a an all star, but that De'Aaron Fox will become an all star because of Domas. And I, like the early returns, I can't argue with that. And I thought it would work. I kept saying this could be the guy to unlock him. I didn't know he would unlock him. Like literally, walk up with a key and unlock the door, and like boom, there he is. Like holy cow, we're seeing a superstar. So, like, I really do think it's interesting how one player can make someone else better so quickly, but another player, you know, two other players, they can't. They're competing for the same type of opportunities, and they can't make each other better. And again, I think it would have worked over time, but the Kings didn't wait to see that. Uh, Like, they didn't give it the time. I'm with you. I I totally think Fox and Tyrese could have worked, um, but with what we have with Domas now, what they have with Domas now is very much like we said, it clicked right away, but that doesn't mean there's not more growth to come. Like they still can get better as a pairing and playing off one another. And primarily to me, like when Domas has the ball in his hands and De'Aaron cutting from there and getting used to playing with the big that likes to post up and is successful at that. Cause I think their two man game of a pick and roll. That's where it's pretty natural, but just because it clicked right away doesn't mean it can't get even better, and I think that we're going to see that because they allegedly plan on getting together this off season and, and working out, and there's just going to be more progress with that duo. Yeah, and I also think like the thing that's totally missing is just how bad the players have been around Fox and and Sabonis. Like, just not to be rude, but they haven't been good, and so we watched a lot of really interesting stuff with the two man game when they're the only two guys that were actually playing like efficient, good basketball for stretches. I think we can throw Harrison Barnes in there. Harrison Barnes had some moments with Domas where you're like, oh man, the back cuts and stuff. I think Chemezi here and there. But overall, the feel was, you know, okay, is Justin Holiday ever going to hit a three pointer ever again? You know, and, you know, Mo Harkless couldn't, like, they didn't go back to Mo and give him more of a shot, but he did play a couple of games with him. And again, If you can't hit a three, if you can't space the floor, then you can't play with this this group because Fox and Sabonis are both going to play primarily inside the arc. And so you need everybody else to space it. And um, I I think we're seeing like the nexus of something that could be very special. And even like if you look at the small sample size, the what did you say, 15 games, what are their overall stats together in 15 games? I mean, if he's averaging almost 29 and and uh, Domas is almost at 19, I mean, we're almost to 50 points a game there, and and we're probably at 17 rebounds, and we're probably at uh, 11 assists, just like spitballing off the top of my head. Yeah, that's not bad for a duo. And like you said, especially when like they're not playing – two on two in the pick and roll they're playing two on three because somebody's ignored in the corner throughout this season and getting those surrounding guys like they do need another top end talent but even just improving the complementary talent would do so much for unlocking that duo and I, I do think that like you're saying that's where there can be more progress um do you feel like there's any aspects of De'Aaron's game that you saw progress in this season like notable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought that, um, I mean, it depends. It depends on where we're talking about. Um, I thought there, there are moments where he became a lockdown defender. Um, and then a lot of moments where, you know, he let allowed inline drives like nonstop. Um, I think that's a cultural thing here in Sacramento where the communication was just so bad on, on the defensive side of the ball. And like, the Kings improved tremendously over the previous season. Like like their defensive rating went up like three or four points, and it was still one of the worst in the league. That just tells you how bad it was the year before. Um, but I think that there was some improvement there. Um, I also think that there was some improvement with Fox on like knowing when to attack, knowing when not to attack. Um, he's one of the best finishers at the rim in the game, especially for guards. I mean, I, I marked it down. He shot 71.4% at the rim. Like that's, yeah, that's like some Jared Allen type number. Like that's Rudy Gobert number. Like that's usually it's big guys, but 
the fact that he was that good, and and I'll say this too, like, um, the mid range jump shot has gone away in the NBA for a, I mean, the last like decade, right? It's it's part of the the analytics of basketball that mid range jump shots are just bad unless you're shooting. 45 46 percent um they're not good shots right because it comes down to points per possession so if De'Aaron Fox is shooting 71.4 percent at the rim that means that he's averaging like 1.42 points per possession at the when he's finishing at the rim um and then if you look at the three-point shot if he's even at 30 percent uh that's still 0.9 points per possession right so every time he's shooting if even if it's 30 percent so if you look at his best numbers, uh, from 3 to 10 feet, he shot 46.6%. From 10 to 16 feet, 45%. Uh, from 16 to the three-point line, 45%. Just so people know, those numbers are tremendous. Like, those are some of the best mid-range jump shooting numbers that you're going to see. They're very good. I'm, they're not DeMar DeRozan range, but they're they're really, really good. Like, the league average is below that, well below that and almost every single one of those ranges. So, but it still equates to like 0.9 points per possession. So that's where you really have to look at like the mid range shot. And I think the one thing I'll, I would point out his, um, his shot start, his shot chart still looks like a shotgun, like splatter, like it's all over the place, but there's so much more green than there is red because he is shooting such a high percentage inside the arc and uh you know the the one key to De'Aaron is always going to be can he improve as a three-point shooter and if he does improve as a three-point shooter how that unlocks everything else because you have to cover him different absolutely and those mid-range numbers are on high volume as well you know I have between four feet to um to the three-point line was 50 percent of his shot attempts this year and, and how many I, shot attempts? Like, did, did you write down the number? Because it's a lot. I have 561 field goal attempts and then 48 fouls. From, okay, actually, 1,210 1, shot attempts of yeah. total. Yeah. Um, he, and of those, most of them are at the rim. He's, I think he's, what, 253s, right? Yes. I'm on cleaning the goal. Last so I have a garbage time filter. I see 244, but yeah. Okay. Um, threes, but yeah, 561 mid-range attempts. Um, you know, I think that a guy that's not a great three-point shooter, if you can be a great mid-range shooter, it's just all about keeping the defense guessing, right? Like, if you get them on their heels because you're one of the fastest players in the league, one of, if not the fastest player in the league, going downhill and such a threat at the rim that if guys are backpedaling a little bit, it's so easy for him to just rise up in the mid range and have that look all day. You know, like that's his spot. We've heard Alvin Gentry say this year, that's his spot. He missed a game winner against Cleveland in, in the mid range this year. But after Alvin was like, would take that shot every day. That's Darren getting to his spot. And it just didn't go down this time. Like I really like the progress that's happened there I, I think obviously you need to see three-point progress still from him but I think a guy like that or you also see like you know John Wall was kind of like this a little bit like that mid-range shot is so important for a guy that's not a three-point shooter and such a downhill threat it really does open up a lot of his game um, definitely do still need to see progress when it comes to his three-point shooting but again like last year he was a way better catch and shoot three-point shooter than he was on pull-ups and that held true again this season you know the entire all of his three-point shots is 4.2 a game and 30 percent but 1.5 of those 4.2 were catch and shoot and he knocked down 35 percent it's the pull-ups that were 2.7 per game where he hit 27 percent and I think like guys going under screens he tried to punish a little bit more but if they're setting them a little lower or rescreening that he is able to punish that if it's a mid-range going under which we saw them do a little bit later in the year with Domas in their two-man game but being able to play off of other guys playing off of Sabonis post-ups like catch and shoots are really important when it comes to his three-point or just his progress and I think that he's been solid in that for two years in a row now. Yeah, I, I think the biggest interesting thing that like you bring up there is the 
the dynamic of him and Domas and the fact that that Domas does not uh, like we see it with Alex Len. Alex Len likes to set his screens all the way out behind the three point line. Like he he usually acts as a trailer, then he sets screens way up high. Um, so using Alex Len as a roller isn't going to work because Alex Len has like twenty three feet to cover to get to the rim, and someone is going to get there before Alex Len does. I mean that's just kind of the way it goes. But with Domas. He sets his, he either goes deep or he sets it right at the elbow. And, uh, and Fox playing off of that, it's almost, again, like the whole unlocking both of them. It really almost is better that Fox is a mid range jump shooter with Sabonis because now you have the threat of him shooting at any time. So I'll go back to like Chris Weber when. Chris Weber, uh, Weber run like, ran like the, the dual horn set or whatever you want to call it. The, the, the Kings ran a dual high post all the time. They had Weber on one side and Blotty on the other. They would both come up together, and then you'd hit one of them, and then all of a sudden, boom, the whole thing is rotating and moving and crazy and all over the place. The fact that Weber could turn around and hit an 18-foot jump shot like made that entire play so incredibly hard to defend because he could pull up and hit, he could take you off the dribble. He could hit a back cut. He could have a guy, Mike Bibby, coming around and, and do a rub screen and give the ball to Bibby for a wide-open jumper. There were so many options. And I think that's what we're going to see with Sabonis, like all of these options that he brings to the table. But the fact that he's not a great shooter, from even from 18 feet, that's a bit of a problem. Unless you have Fox, who is that good, from that area and can open the game back up for him. So we talked about this in one of the pods, how um, Fox and Sabonis both have talked about how they're both left-handed and how that is so incredibly hard to defend because people keep trying to force Fox right. That's typically what they do. They try to get him to force force him right to go to his weak hand. Um, and now if they try to force him right, like it opens the lane for Sabonis to just destroy them because he can roll left and he's wide open at the rim. So if you're hedging your big to go take away the left hand of De'Aaron Fox, it opens everything for for uh, Sabonis to like swing the gate right to the rim. And it, it also, when they decide, okay, we're not going to let Sabonis do that anymore, now you have Fox. You have Fox who's who has his wide open left hand going at the rim. And so, yeah, I, I think it's a, a, a crazy dynamic that we're going to see develop and develop and develop and um, and as long as they keep them together and let them grow together, I think it can be an elite combo. I think it definitely can. Uh, you got to surround it with length and shooting, like De'Aaron pointed out when we talked to him for those exit interviews. But I think it definitely can be there. They both do need to improve as a shooter because as much as I like the progress from De'Aaron when it came to the mid-range shot, I think some of that is out of necessity because he hasn't been a good three-point shooter off the dribble. And obviously that still would be the most ideal thing is him making progress there as a shooter. Um, so, yeah, I do really like the base that the Kings were working with, with Fox and Sabonis. And I think that it was an interesting year of De'Aaron for sure. I, I Also, the free throw percentage jumped from... 71.9 last year to 75% this year. Not a big jump, but I think that's an aspect we wanted to see a bit of progress, and we did this season. There was maybe some moments, like I think it's the Charlotte game I'm thinking of, that he missed He missed one or two that lost them the game pretty much, and he was oh, yeah, he really hard two. on himself post-game. Yeah. Yes. So there's definitely still progress that needs to be made there, but I, I do think we saw some progress this season, which is an aspect that was really important because I do think he's a guy that should get to the line, you know, is up there with some of the top five players in the league when it comes to free throw attempts per game. And there was an adjustment this season of, again, a whistle that I think was frustrating him. He probably – I don't know that I love how much he's – talking to refs sometimes and, and complaining, but I, I do think he could also get some more whistles and there was a little bit of progress there. No, I think so. I think that um, like the way that the league, so every time we come into every year, we come into the league, they have points of emphasis 
and they used to send a um an NBA ref to every arena like on opening night or like they would make their way around during preseason and all the media members would sit down and we'd watch a video and they would show us what their points of emphasis would be. And like half the time it was like the points of emphasis were specifically you're watching the screen and this is the same tape they're showing every team, but it's always the Kings who are getting scored on. Like, I, I swear it's almost like the league, like <laughs> intentionally, intentionally screws the Kings over and makes them like the poster child for whatever it is that they're going to do. It's like, here's Willie Cauley Stein doing something incorrectly that we're going to call this year. <laughs> and it's like, ah, oh, Willie, come on, Willie. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's the point of emphasis this year was to take away the unnatural play right the unnatural motion and the refs took it the wrong way the unnatural uh play that they were looking to take away was almost like just two players like hey trey and hey james harden we need you to stop doing the like stop thing you like stepping in front of somebody and stopping um that's not natural and we're going to start calling you for the foul and not the other person um, I, I thought it was interesting. It's sort of Davion used that move quite a few times this year where he would stop, get someone on his back, and then accelerate to the rim and, and uh, you know, go attack the rim. Um, but I think that the refs took it the wrong way early, and guys like Fox, who are at the rim all the time, you know, that score most of their baskets inside the three-point line and deserve to get foul calls— they just weren't calling him, and De'Aaron's like, look, I, nothing I do is an unnatural move. I don't even use a Euro step very often. Like, that's not what this was for. And uh, what did he, he averaged 1.3 less free throws per game, so it, it cost him like 0. 0.9 points per game, maybe a point per game, and that's why we see him drip, uh, dip from, you know, 25.2 to what he finished, 23.2, something like that. Yeah. One of those points is very specifically because of the way the game was called, especially in the first half of the season. Um, and then one of those points is because he took f like far fewer three-point attempts than he did the previous year. Um, and so that's where you lose your points per game. And overall, I mean, that's where if he is a 28, 29 point a game score, which I think he can be, I'm not sure he can do it for 82. He's probably more like a 26, 27 point guy if he's really rolling, but if he is that type of player, he will eventually start getting calls because that's the way it goes. Like even on the Sacramento Kings, Mitch Richmond got calls, you know, like even when they were bad and they weren't going to the playoffs, he still got calls. So I think eventually if you consistently show that that's who you are as a player and that not that these streaks, these 15 game streaks are like anomalies, uh, then I think you will get more and more respect from the officials. Yeah, and foul hunting is, like, part of the game. Um, you know, I don't necessarily love that it is, but it is. And that was one of the areas that De'Aaron really excelled last year, and I, I think you really saw it affect the smaller players. Like, Embiid and Giannis were not all too affected at the beginning of the season by that because it's very clear when those guys get fouled. I mean, they're getting fouled every single time, but if they're getting bumped, you know that there was some contact. It's not hard to miss. De'Aaron's kind of getting bumped most possessions, so it's hard to maybe a little bit more difficult to gauge, especially when they have that point of emphasis. Like Harrison Barnes had 1.3 more free throw attempts per game this season. He was very intent with getting to the line and he's a very physical player like he's got a consistent pace to him I think it's just easier to see when there's contact on Harrison um, and so I, I think that there's just weird aspects to it right and I don't have any issues with De'Aaron hunting fouls I think it's just part of the game and it's an aspect of like you can't stay in front of De'Aaron you kind of have to hit him sometimes and he probably could get a few more whistles and we saw that change as the year went along and I think it's something that we'll see um continued in the next season like it's just a big part of Darren's game and I have no issues with that yeah I don't either and I'll also say like Harrison Barnes um almost exclusively goes to a euro step in the key so the slowest you're watching euro step it you've ever seen you're watching it in slow motion. 
I, I still think Kyle Anderson goes to a slower Euro step because you can actually like, like that lady could have glued her hand to the floor in the amount of time Kyle Anderson takes to go through his Euro step. Um, there's an aspect sometimes where I'm like, at what point is this a travel? Because I think he stopped in between those steps. I'm not really <laughs> sure he did. <laughs> uh, you're like slowly leaning. Yeah. Like, I is he still taking steps? I'm is confused. That a pivot yeah. So or a euro. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, I'm always confused. I'm always confused by it too. So, uh, yeah, like I think Harrison made it more obvious, right? It's it's clear when Harrison's getting fouled because it is a super slow mo move. Um, and, and I'm okay with it too. And I'll also tell you this, like I, people might not know this. The Kings actually brought in, uh, a former NBA referee this year. His name is Don. I can't remember his last name. He's a super nice guy. He worked with them on how to draw fouls all season. Like that's like some of the stuff you're seeing from Davion, some of the stuff you're seeing from De'Aaron from, uh, specifically from Harrison. Like those are things that, uh, an NBA official, a former NBA official is now a consultant who does this. He goes around from one team to the next. That's what he does. He he teaches guys how the game is called and how it's going to be called. And and not only that, but like tendencies of officials, um, you know, like this is part of the secret sauce that is the Sacramento Kings. But like, um, you know, like you need to uh, – Tyrese Halliburton has a – had a, um, a thing where he would walk up to the scorer's table every game and go, okay, I just want to make sure. And he would name the three officials – and they would go, yes, that's who the officials are. And it's like, do you know which one is which? Well, let me make sure. And it's like, okay, yeah, I know who the officials are. He knew first and last name. So when he addressed an official, he would always walk up and use their first name. Because that's Ty. Like, that's Ty in a nutshell. He's He game preps in a different way than other people. I think that that is still something that um, some of the, the other kings could work on. And like, get to know the officials, have a conversation with them about like, why it is you think you're getting fouled? Why it is, you, you know, that you think you're not getting the call? And like, hey, can you watch for this? You know, he's hitting my hip and pushing me out. Or or we're going shoulder to shoulder, but he's also leaning and shoving me off. You know, like, there are ways that De'Aaron could could have better communication. But again, it's it's about communication a lot of the time when it comes to De'Aaron. So, uh, but there is times where I, I think that he does get jobbed as far as uh, by the officials when it comes to fouls. Definitely. And just to point out, like, you know, he had a decrease in assists this year, 7.2 last year to 5.6 this year. I don't think that's any, like, regression as a passer or anything like that. It's just Tyrese um, having the ball in his hands a lot or or Delmas having the ball in his hands a lot. And even Davion falls into that. Um, I think just for the sake of, like, people look at that number and it's a significant difference, but I didn't see any change. And, like, De'Aaron is still a great passer that's going to make the right pass whenever it's there. Um, Yeah. The Chemezi pass. That's the one that like, that shows you the signature pass. It was the Chemezi pass. And then um, it was, it was Fox who had the, the amazing pass to Dante DiVincenzo, right? He did in OKC, like a over his shoulder, where when you're he wrapped watching, around, he wrapped yeah. around and it fired out of like a crowd of three dudes. The angle that we have on the camera, because yeah, they're on the road, was you couldn't even see De'Aaron anymore. His hand in the ball just came out of nowhere and it flipped right into Dante's shooting pocket. Yeah, yeah, very impressive. Um, okay, so and I'll touch base. The one thing you did say, like. He started out the season 5.3 assists, uh, 6.3 in the first month, <clears throat> 5.3, 4.3 assists in December. That's as he really did relinquish the starting point guard duties to Halliburton. Hang on, I'm going to take a drink. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, but January, 5.3 assists, still Halliburton is there. We get to February, you start to see him uptick, 6.1, and then he finish the last month of the season. He finished March uh, at 7.4 assists per game. And uh, that's that's right in his range. I always thought he would be more like more like John Wall, where he averaged 20 and 8. Um, but I think it's more, the more we see De'Aaron, he's probably more like a 25, 26, and 6.5. 
that's that's where I can. But like, I think he is going to take that step into like the elite scorer stratosphere. Um, like he probably won't win a scoring title because of the three point shot, but he will still have an opportunity to be like one of the top ten scorers in the league. I think this year he finished what number fifteen in the league in scoring, I believe, um, something like that. And I think last year, if he would have just hit like a, a couple of free throws. Um, if his percentage would have been like four percent higher or five percent higher, he would have been like a, a top ten score. Yeah. So all right, I got something for you, James. It's hammer Uh-oh. time here. Stop. What? It's oh, hammer time. You got me for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Can De'Aaron Fox be a good defender? Can you have a good defense with De'Aaron Fox as one of your focal points? Is it a Devin Booker where it's you know, just a system and the guys around him. And once you get other guys, it's like, oh, Devin Booker actually is a decent defender. If you put the right length and athleticism around him, he can be solid. He can't be, I don't think he can be a plus plus defender. Um, But I do think in specific stretches of games when it's needed, he can be a plus defender. There are moments where De'Aaron Fox is exceptional. And then the problem is that he shows those moments and then he doesn't come back to them. Was it uh, Chris Middleton that he got asked to cover earlier in the season and and was like a game changer on Middleton? I know Jimmy uh, Butler was a big one. Yeah, like we saw that he was able to defend bigger players. And uh, you know what? I, I guess that's – it's a good question, Brendan, because, um, you know, there aren't a lot of good defensive point guards in the league. Like there's Pat Bev and then there's Davion Mitchell. And then I don't know, you, you kind of stop. Like most point guards are, I mean, Damian Lillard, uh, that dude doesn't play defense at all. I mean, Steph Curry has gotten better on the defensive end, but it's really, it's more of a system that supported him. He's still not a great defender. Um, Yeah. So well, and I think that's what you need. Like, I think for me, it's just like a don't be a liability because there were times this year that he was. But mm-hmm. I think, like you're saying, he also showed that he doesn't have to be. Like, he can be better than that. I think with the offensive production that you get from De'Aaron Fox, that just being an average defender is more than enough. And I think that I'm at a point where I think I've seen enough flashes where I think that he can be that when he needs to. I agree. I'll also tell you that Buddy Heald is a well below average NBA defender and that Tyrese Halliburton is possibly below that. And uh, like they, he did not have great defenders around him, especially in the backcourt. There were a lot of blow buys. And I, I think that bad defense can be contagious like turnovers can be contagious, like three-point shooting can be contagious. I think poor defense, when you watch someone get blown by again and again and again and again, it can be bad. It, it, it does, like, other players become worse and worse and worse. Um, the Nobody's defensive system. containing anyone for 20 seconds. At some point, a guy's going to get by you, and if you don't have faith in your back line, it's hard to lock in and actually play good perimeter defense for 16 seconds well and i would even say this too like one of the biggest things that's totally missed about this season is it's not just that rashawn holmes didn't play very much and that he had problems and all that stuff you know it it, it's not that it's he just wasn't as good like at the end of the day he was not as good especially on the defensive end um you know we're talking about a guy who averaged 1.6 blocks per game last year and, and this year he averaged 0.9 uh, you know he he defended the perimeter really well in the past and losing him and having guys like Tristan Thompson or uh, or Alex Len or even even Damian Jones Damian Jones is okay defending the perimeter but losing those guys losing a guy like Rashawn and having him just n- like literally not be available for most of the season, that hurt. It made De'Aaron Fox look worse defensively. It made Tyrese Halliburton work worse defensively. I think 
when we watched uh, the the Kings play the Pacers, and you just watched Davion Mitchell just tear up Tyrese Halliburton. It was one of those eye-opening moments where you're like, oh, wow, we, like, I knew he wasn't great, but we may have missed how bad he was. Like, and then, and again, like, not to bag Ty, because there are moments, his uh, basketball IQ is incredible, so he had all those steals. off as a, a really good defender. Yeah, but they're, they're team defensive plays, right? They, he's making reads that are spectacular, but on ball, you know, I... I mean, I if have Alex... no comments, no comments on Tyrese's defense. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> if if Alex Len would have played like 24 minutes a game this year, and I know people just cringe, like that would have helped the Kings' defense be solid. Like he is a true rim protector. He's a gigantic man. But the fact that you had like 17 centers on the roster and no way to play like one guy like that who does one specific thing, and you had to keep going to different things. That that makes it tough, and I think that's uh, it. It kind of brings us like we we see what De'Aaron is. We know that there's room for him to improve. We know that there's there's a way if there is a way for him to be the player that he finished March as to open next season. Then I think the Kings are actually they can be a good team. Um, but what is it that you see that would optimize De'Aaron? Uh, when it comes to, like, what do the Kings have to do to make him better? Shooting. They have to get as much shooting around De'Aaron Fox and Demonis Sabonis also as possible. We're talking about a guy that's an elite finisher, and the easiest way, like, this year, I think part of the reason he's not fully able to get to the rim is that the spacing is just unideal around him so often there's a guy that's being completely ignored that's also on the floor whether it be Mo Harkless or Chemezi Metu or Marvin Bagley um, even I think like Trey Lyles I guess has more respect but they're choosing to leave those guys open rather than let De'Aaron get to the rim and I think they just need to have guys that you can't leave wide open that if they get a wide open catch and shoot three, they are going to punish you. And not just some of the time, like Chemezi Metu kind of being streaky there. Those guys are okay three point shooters, but that's not enough. Like De'Aaron Fox needs as much space to be able to drive to the rim as possible and not have to deal with all of these help defenders. Because when those help defenders come in, he's going to make the right pass. Like we saw again, the Chemezi Metu one, you know, I, Again, I'm saying they need a better shooter than Metu, but Metu knocked it down that day because um, I want to say it was Dorian Finney-Smith, but maybe I'm wrong there, overhelped off, and De'Aaron makes the right read. So to me, it is just all about getting as much shooting around De'Aaron Fox as possible. And, And he mentioned length as well when we talked to him, and I think that applies to the defense of, you know, like we saw with Davion, like Alvin is saying Davion slowed down because we're asking him to do everything out there. We're asking him to guard the best player on the other team and mm-hmm. go get us 2010. De'Aaron and Fox is asked to do so much on the offensive end that he shouldn't be asked to guard Steph Curry on the other end of the floor. Ideally, you have somebody else, Davion Mitchell, do that. And when De'Aaron needs to, he gets switched onto it that he's capable, but he shouldn't have that responsibility because that's just exerting too much energy all over the floor. So I think having somebody that can guard the primary initiator and be the one that's getting through screens on the defensive end, while it, so it's less of hiding De'Aaron, but more so conserving his energy on that end, and then also shooting on the other end is kind of where I'm at this offseason, which I think are things we've been saying for a long time here. They are. Um, I, I'll say this. I, I think that having Domas will actually help preserve energy for De'Aaron. Um, the fact that you can run the offense through him for large stretches. I'd also say that most of the time when you're looking at plays that involve De'Aaron and Domas, they're in smaller spaces as opposed to De'Aaron having to set, get a bunch of screens set for him. Like as far as like energy exertion, I think you know when you're trying to set up an offensive play and you're starting out at the three-point line or further uh, versus at 16 to 18 feet, like there's just 
more energy exerted by the further out you are. So I, I think that those are things that will help. Um, and, and I'm going to ask you this. Um, let's say that the that the Kings come back next year and they don't make a major change in the backcourt. Um, and you come back with Davion, you come back with uh, Dante, with uh, Terrence Davis, with Justin Holiday. If you were making the decision, which of those players have the skill set that you would look to put next to Fox? For me, it's Dante DiVincenzo. Um, I really do buy him as a shooter. I know the numbers weren't great for him this season, but he still was a really good catch-and-shoot three-point shooter, as we've pointed out before. And ideally, he's not running the pick and roll very often or anything i think if it's swung to him that he can make the right pass if need be like presented an advantageous situation on some weak side action and defensively i think he can be the guy that is guarding the um guarding the pick and roll or the primary initiator on the other end like dante's the guy to me of just uh he fits as a role player and as long as he plays within that role that's the guy I would go with. Um, where are you at between the three? Yeah, I'm going to agree 100%. Um, look, I, I think the problem that you have, um, that okay, the problem that you had with Ty is that the way that Tyrese Halliburton handled the ball was very specific. He handled the ball like Chris Paul handles the ball, like Steve Nash handles the ball. Like when he's going to run a play, it's it's him he's on an island he's doing his thing and he needs you know he he's playing off other people who's in two-man games he's finding you know cross-court passes and stuff but it is when he has the ball it's a high usage situation his usage wasn't that high with the kings but when he has the ball it is so it's almost like when he doesn't have the ball any play that he does do is such a quick catch and shoot. So he, his usage isn't high in those situations, but like when I'm watching his numbers, his usage rate and stuff like that, they don't match what you see on the court at all. I think DiVincenzo is a very good passer. He's a very good secondary assist man. And with the Kings, he can even be a third assist man when you're looking at a creator a creator for others uh, when you look at Fox and Sabonis as your two primaries. I think the fact that he can create off the dribble, he can create for others, um, and then, of course, the defensive angle. Like, the fact that, you know, Davion talked about this all the time. Like, when De'Aaron is here, the best, the team, the op opposition's best defender is on De'Aaron. He draws the toughest cover. And that allows guys like Davion or Dante to draw secondary defenders, guys that aren't as good. And so it, it helps them as well. It helps them be better players. Ty and did from that a lot earlier this year. Yeah, yeah. I think Ty did too, because even when he got going in the pick and roll, your best the the opposing team's best defender is off to the side. Ty's and then all game, of a sudden he had those seventeen assists against OKC, Lou Dort far and away best defender is on De'Aaron the entire time yeah yeah and, and I mean that's very specific like that's how good teams are built they're built where you have guys that are helping each other's uh you know weaknesses and pluses and you know there's a huge difference between a starting level shooting guard and a secondary uh, second team shooting guard and so again like I, I like Dante DiVincenzo's fit and I also think that the way that I saw Davion Mitchell develop as a passer it wasn't it's in a starting role or as a primary off the bench it's as a primary ball handler off the bench or it's as a starting point guard it's not as a secondary guy so if that makes sense like I think in order for Davion to get the 7 8 9 10 12 assists 15 assists which he did I think twice a season in order for him to do that, the ball has to be in his hands the whole time. So it's almost like Halliburton, where I think you can get plenty of assists out of Dante DiVincenzo as a secondary or third guy. 
And so that's why I would choose him. And and it's also why I think Davion off the bench makes so much sense to me because um, you can hand the ball over to him when Fox goes out of the game and say, go do your thing. And then when Fox comes back in, you're going to slide over and you're going to be the off-ball guy. Um, but I don't think we're going to see the competing for um, for plays like because that's what it is. Like There's a set of plays for Tyrese Halliburton. There's a set of plays for De'Aaron Fox. I think at a certain point they started splitting who was getting what, how many amounts of plays that were being run for them. Um, I don't think that, da- that Davion is going to get plays run for him when Fox is in the game. When Fox is out of the game, sure, it's your show. You go do your thing. But as he, he'll be a secondary third score, four score when he's in the game with Fox and Sabonis and some of these other guys. So uh, that that's my take. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see how it all works out, especially with DiVincenzo um, and his restricted free agency and, and all that situation, whether it gets worked out, worked out or not. Yeah, there's definitely, as we've said plenty of times on this show, plenty of change that I think we're expecting to see this offseason. And maybe that means improvement at the two-guard spot, and it's none of those guys. And that's maybe the bench you're working with. We're going to kind of have to see how it all plays out. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Fox didn't finish the season on the, uh, you know, playing. Um, And we're going to we're going to be honest with you. Like we heard plenty of things behind the scenes about like, I mean, Fox told us uh, at his final, like they got to the Orlando game and that might've been the first game where he could have actually played, but he would have only been a catch and shoot guy because he literally couldn't do anything with his right hand. His right hand was beat up. Um, We've never been able to confirm it through the team, but, but Brendan, do we know that uh, were there rumors of, this being slightly more than just a uh, a bruised hand? There definitely was. And, you know, like you see De'Aaron with a, um, with a, not a cast, a brace around his wrist, yeah. similar to Soft what Terrence Davis brace. had at that point. Um, yeah, I, I, there was definitely whispers of De'Aaron, it, it being more significant that, maybe there was a fracture going on there rather than just pain management like we were kind of hearing. And I I think that that would make a lot of sense. You know, De'Aaron said that when we just talked to him that he couldn't, it says, quote, like my hand, I couldn't really see the bones and everything on my hand and stretched out ligaments. It was fat. Frankie said that when he rewatched the video that his hand looked all purple from that day. Mm. Um, I think that it was probably more significant than it was played up to be. Yeah. Okay, and I'm just going to uh, – we, we've touched on, like, there's been, like, three or four moments where we talked about things that happened during the season. Um, you, talk, you mentioned Fox missing a pair of free throws. I forgot about that game where he missed a pair of free throws. Was that in Charlotte? Where yes. was that? Okay, and they went from they were down one. He had a chance to take the lead with like two point seven seconds or two point eight seconds, and um, no timeouts left for Charlotte. Like if he hits the two free throws, he said that he front rimmed the first one and then he overcompensated on the second one. Yep. Okay, that's one. Um, we were also talking about uh, the the play. Um, the Cleveland miss for the game winner? Yeah, well, not even that. There, There's another game that I was thinking of where we were talking about the Metu, where Metu hit the three, right? Who was it that the Kings were playing when Justin Holiday, for no reason at all, with the Kings up to left his man wide open in the corner? Uh, he sagged off for a wide open three and gave the up a three. other Dallas game. It was in Dallas when De'Aaron had his career high was that dorian finney smith that hit the three from the corner it was. okay that's two yeah that was in dallas darren had 44 in that game 44 and a veteran inexplicably inexplicably left his man in the corner where you couldn't give up a three if a two a two would have tied it if i'm not mistaken a three loses a game uh maybe i'm off on that it, it's possible that it was a, a one-point game and they he lost hit a by three. one yeah, so they were up to 
he hits a three from the corner and they lose by one. Um, that's two games without even like delving into like all the other ridiculousness. And there was another game that we were that we had mentioned too. Um, the Kings missed the play in by two games, three games. Yeah, so it, it's a it's a game of inches. Eighty two game season, every game matters, and uh, and if you don't pay attention, then they they matter a lot more at the end. Um, and so that, that's one thing I think we learned from this season. Uh, we were going to talk about, we, we've, uh, we spent a lot more time on De'Aaron Fox and I thought we would, um, did you, have you kept up with your time codes? I have like, but <laughs> initially I was like, I guess just going to have one block of about De'Aaron Fox. And then I started to have a little more detail. So somewhat, yes. Yeah. I think we spent more time on Fox than we intended to, uh, but that's okay. I mean, he is the, the team's best player. Uh, you know, whether Sabonis takes that crown or not, um, you know, I, I think that he is still the Kings' best player. Um, Sabonis said he was surprised with how good De'Aaron was, by the way. Yeah. He said he no. knew that he was good, but it was even more than he thought. Yeah, he's never played with someone that fast. Like, I mean, that's one of those things where you start playing with someone like that. You're like, holy cow. I can't believe how fast he is. Um, we had the uh, the situation in Minnesota. Um, where, like, in all r- reality, like, Minnesota celebrated like they won, like, the NBA championship. And um, they took some heat for it. And they took some heat from, from TNT, right? Yeah, post game. Yeah, like, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I understand acknowledging that it was a lot. But I think also, I mean, covering in a, a team that's in a, similar situation like minnesota just had a very long playoff drought as well that they ended by going to the eighth by being the eighth seed one season with jimmy butler tom thibodeau taj gibson that whole team andrew wiggins still at the time and then just didn't see the playoffs again after that until this point you know like they're a team that's deprived of the playoffs similarly to sacramento and i can't help but think like what would golden one center look like if the Kings secured a playoff seat, you know, like, so I, I do think it was probably a little over the top, but I also understand where they're coming from it, because contextualizing it is really important. You know, it's not just like a team making the seventh seed. It's a team that has really struggled to make the playoffs. Like Patrick Beverly said at the beginning of the year that he's never missed the postseason in his career and he doesn't plan on doing it. And everybody acted like he was crazy. Carl Anthony Towns had a lot of, difficult situations this season when it came to things with his family and and people well, last season away. too yeah um like contextualizing it like it was i understand maybe it was a little much but i personally loved seeing it one of the things that gets me the most is watching people experience moments that they're going to remember th- for the rest of their lives and that definitely felt like that so Maybe I laughed a little bit when Pat Bev is on the scorer's table and throwing his jersey into the crowd. Um, but it's against his ex-team that didn't want to pay him. Like, I think it makes sense, you know? Where were you I, at? I love it. To be honest, like, this is what sports is about. It's about, you know, even if it, it at certain times it can be a little bit of, like, over the top. Uh, the Timberwolves missed the playoffs for 13 consecutive seasons. Then they made it once, and then they missed the last three. So 16 of the last 17 seasons, they've missed the playoffs. And um, not only did they survive the play-in, they, they cemented themselves as, like, the seven seed. This was a big deal. And I know, like, at some point, people are like, well, act like you've been there. Or they haven't been there. That group of young players... Like, they got there once, and it really wasn't even their get there. Uh, they, you know, Jimmy Butler carried them. And so they got there, but then he left, and they went right back to being horrible and bad. And so I'm okay with it because I know that, like, there would be people crying at a Kings game if they made the playoffs, and rightfully so. Like, I, I mean, like, you're looking around. If, if somehow the Sacramento Kings make uh, the postseason next season, if I— if I look over to my left and see Gary Gerald, I will probably tear up. Like, 
that guy deserves to get back to the playoffs. Uh, you know, like we don't get to do this forever and he deserves to get back to the playoffs and I would get probably emotional for him. Um, but at the same time, like that's what we're, you're supposed to celebrate. You're supposed to celebrate when you win. And I I know it might've been like over the top, but you know, and then the, the, did you watch the footage of the lady trying to glue her hand to the floor? (laughs) No. Did you miss that? Yeah. I did not see that this was a thing. I don't know oh no, I she that. she snuck out onto the floor, like on the baseline, and tried to super glue her hand to the floor what, in the middle of the game. Oh, middle of the game. And, and protest. There was she had a shirt on that uh, some sort of protest. I'm not sure what she was protesting. I haven't really but they were able to get like pull off her hand before it fully stuck and then they escorted her out of the building and she's been um, she's been banned from the arena for a year. <laughs> I'm like, it's crazy. Like, Makes who sense. tries to like stick their hand to the floor? But I've things referencing it, so now I understand. Yeah. So, uh, like, look, um, I, I think I've said this. I said it early in the season. We're seeing this really weird thing where people don't know how to behave in public <laughs> right now. They don't. They we've been locked up at, for for a couple of years. And I remember the first game we went uh, that they allowed fans in. Some there's only 1,200 fans, and some guy got loose, like I hammered. He's there with his mom, was trying to throw fists with the with the security, and they're dragging him out of this the arena. And I'm just like, man, people just do not know how to behave in public anymore. And um, yeah, the the <laughs> pandemic. Over this glue thing, like, what is the thought process? Do you is it is it liquid glue that you're just your hand is covered I think she and like you go down like, there like you got ten seconds can, can you <laughs> sit there for ten <laughs> seconds <laughs> right did you if she mentioned this to anybody if anybody told her yeah this is a good idea they are not actually they <laughs> they're not talking to friends. the wrong people <laughs> no like nobody was like maybe uh, don't do this like uh, glue glue I don't. Okay. I, I it cracks me up that you're just now seeing this. Um, yeah, it, it was a thing. It was a thing. Um, I guess <laughs> I I don't know. Like, like Deuce and Mo have a clip where they're like reacting to it. Morgan's like, "What is happening? Like, it, what is she doing? Like, oh, they don't usually pan to someone on the floor because you're thinking, oh, it's a streaker. Oh, they usually don't give them court time, uh, like uh, video time. You're like, oh, look at it. And they're like, wait, what is she doing? Like, oh, no, what is she doing? Like, yeah, it's good stuff. I mean, I, people are crazy. People are crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so let's touch base on a couple of things before we get out of here. Uh, number one, uh, there's Brendan. A, there's a handprint on the floor in glue. There's a handprint on the floor in there's glue. There's a picture of it. Oh, God. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. This is hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, people are crazy. Okay. Uh, Brendan, you and, and uh, Bryant are, are going to do a uh, – you're going to fire up your stage one of, of draft coverage over at uh, um, the King's Pulse podcast. Uh, what are you guys doing? What, what do we need to preview here? Yes, the plan, uh, we're going to do two people per episode, and we did this the last two seasons as well. Um, Bryant did it with me last year, and the offseason prior to that was with Rich Ivanowski. But, yeah, we're going to go through just deep diving each of these prospects. And by the end of it, we'll probably have 40 and slowly build out a big board. But, you know, I have decent knowledge on a handful, 15 maybe prospects right now. But, like, really diving into them. We spent about a week watching a ridiculous amount of their games. And the two we got right now is Jabari Smith Jr. and Chet Holmgren, starting with the top of the draft and kind of moving down from there. Two guys that I think are really ideal fit for the Kings and they'd have to get a little bit of good luck to probably have any chance to actually select either of those guys. But diving into their games, um, their pros and cons from a general prospect aspect, and then also how it would relate to their fit with the Kings and maybe our preference between the two of, and as we get a little later, like I know the next episode will be Paulo Banchero and, and Keegan Murray and 
Um, I think because Keegan that, Murray's going number four. Obviously, obviously. No, we're trying to do similar prototypes in a way. Okay, um, that makes sense. Like after that, will be Jaden Ivey, Johnny Davis, similar style okay. of players, at least somewhat similar. Yeah, AJ Griffin and uh, Ben uh, Matherin. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay, thing. so, but that is the plan. I I love doing draft content. I oh, fell yeah. for it that season, that prolonged COVID season with the bubble and everything because we had so much time. That was the Tyrese Halliburton draft. That process just was so long. And it was. since then, I've fallen in love with doing draft stuff. So kicking that off on King's Pulse Podcast today. Uh, I also love the draft. Um, we did, uh, one year I did 22 mocks, like the the year you're talking about. I did 22 versions, mock 22.0. It was brutal um, because we were in, you know, a shutdown. Uh, but usually it's like 10, 12 uh, mock drafts. Um, I think I'll do a mock this year. And if I do one mock, then that means I'm going to do like five or six versions of it. Um, but uh, as we kind of get closer and closer to the, the finish line, um, we're going to switch and start doing a lot of draft coverage. Um, and I think with Fox, we, we did, we went way long, but we're probably going to break other players up into much shorter segments, like a 30 minute segment. And then we'll do more draft, uh, more, we'll start building up the free agency. We'll start, you know, the coaching search is going to keep going. Uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, like ad nauseum here until the Kings actually land on a guy. Um, and you know, there's plenty of stuff there to, it, there's a lot of intrigue. They, the Kings are actually in a good position where, as of right now, I think it's only them and the Lakers who have uh, relieved their coach of duties and um, are moving on. And that means that there are a lot of good coaches that are available. And when you talk about one out of 30, um, you know, there's only two openings. One of them is a hot mess, but is going to pay you a bunch of money. Uh, the other is a hot mess and you have no idea what you're going to get paid <laughs> or how much control you're going to have or what your team is going to look like. Um, and I'll let you guys figure out which of the two of those, the, those things are, but, uh, I guess we'll get to, we'll finish with this, the business of basketball. It's early. It's so early in the process. Who is your front runner? Who would you like to see if it were like right now, who's your coach? And I guess you can even open it up if there's a coach that you think might become available or. Uh, whatever it might be, like, who is it you're looking at? I mean, that little asterisk is going to make me jump to Quinn Snyder, but I won't take that easy road out. Um, I'm really interested in the Milwaukee assistants, but I think that in those are Darvin Ham and Charles Lee, but mm -hmm. I think my favorite right now is going to be Kenny Atkinson. I liked the culture that we saw built in Brooklyn, and I think he did a good job of having guys overperform based on the talent level that they were dealing with in Brooklyn. And he's been alongside Steve Kerr now and worked with that developmental team. Um, I think Kenny Atkinson is a guy that, to me, is still a new head coach. Um, he doesn't have that much experience, but just enough for me that I see – how it would work and again a lot of it for me is overperforming based on the talent level that we saw in Brooklyn and, and there was a culture and a buy-in there that I think we haven't seen with the Kings okay um I like Kenny Atkinson too he, he's 54 years old um he he did have uh four seasons at the helm in Brooklyn I, I don't think he finished his last year um but I'm not sure about well, yeah he, he coached 66 games so um you know, he had one season where he led them to the playoffs. But even in that one season, I'm going to guess that their uh, their roster wasn't spectacular. Uh, that one season, they were 19th in offensive rating. They were 14th in defensive rating. They had a net rating of .01. Like, Kings fans should dream of a net rating of .01. Uh, or .1, sorry. Uh, pace, uh, 11th out of 30 teams. Um, and, and his star studded cast was D'Angelo Russell, Joe Harris, Spencer Dimwitty, uh, Karis LeVert, Alan Crabb, Jared Allen, uh, Carol, uh, Rondé Hollis Jefferson. Um, and, and again, this is like at a point where, um, uh, most of those guys are young, 
Like D'Angelo Russell is, is 22 years old. Um, you know, some of these guys were just getting into the league. Levert is only 24. Uh, Den Woody is 25. Um, Jared Allen was 20. So, um, I mean, your fifth most minutes played is Damari Carroll. Sixth is Ed Davis. Seventh is Rodnish Kukris. Kurooks. That's how it is. Kurooks. Uh, yeah, Rodian's Kurooks. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, man, Kenneth Fareed played on that team. Interesting. Whatever happened to Kenneth Fareed? Um, yeah, so uh, Kenny's an interesting pick. Um, you know, I, I have always enjoyed Terry Stotts, and I'm intrigued by that. I'm not sure. Uh, like, I'm not concerned about the defensive side uh, as much because, you know, like you need good defensive players to play good defense. Um, but he's a guy who did lead a team to a uh, Western Conference Finals um, with a guard-heavy team, but also with a big man that could pass in Nurkic. Um, so Terry Stotts is, is kind of one guy that I would center on um, early in the process. I, I do like him. Uh, I, I'd say, you know, again, one of the downfalls, and uh, like don't think of this as like ageism, but uh, Terry Stotts is 64 and I, I think a lot of times what if you're a team like the Kings, you should be looking for a guy that you can grow with and sort of fit into a role long term. Um, I'm not a big D'Antoni. Like, I just don't think he's right for this specific time and, and roster. Um, but, you know, like, again, I, I think if you're looking at uh, the nine seasons that Terry Stott spent in Portland, 402 and 318, a 558 win percentage. Um, he actually, you know, his playoff record isn't great as 22 and 40, but, uh, you know, the Kings, Kings fans would love to have a 22 and 40 playoff record. Cause that means you actually made the playoffs once, um, you know, that's, that's 62 games of, of playoffs and the Kings have zero in 16 years. So, yeah. and it's, yeah. it's always difficult with like the Milwaukee guys, the research I do again, Charles, um, Charles Lee and Darvin Ham. They intrigue me, for sure. They're younger guys. Yeah. It's just hard, at least from my point of view, to know. Because what aspects are they responsible for uh, um, behind Budenholzer? Or it, it's just more difficult when you don't have anything to base it off of because so much of that is going on behind the scenes. And it's just hard to get a gauge of what assistants are going to translate into good head coaches because ideally you would get a young guy that you can grow with, uh, Taylor Jenkins, who came from under Budenholzer as well. Um, but it's a little hard to gauge from the outside with some of those assistants that haven't had head coaching opportunities already. Yeah, I think um, it, it's funny. We always talk about, like in the NFL, we always talk about coaching trees, right? But in the NBA, it, it isn't always talked about that much about your coaching tree. Uh, Budenholzer is from the Popovich coaching tree, um, you know, and a lot of guys are, I think Kenny Atkinson is, is as well, right? Am I wrong? I, I thought he was so. I can brought in by, yeah, now I'm going to have to look this up. Um, let me see. He was under New York from 08 to... Oh, no. Uh, 12, okay. But then Atlanta after, which is Budenholzer. Yeah, he's in Budel with Budenholzer. And uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, Wes Wilcox in, those Atl in that Atlanta time. Um, mm. Yeah. And then it, even if you look at his, uh, like, he was with the Clippers. Clippers had a good staff. Uh, Atkinson had a, was with the Clippers last year. I mean, he and, is— And he's with Kerr now, who's a Popovich guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting. Like the the pop coaching tree is like vast, and and so you look at guys that like are under Budenholzer. They're you know they are under the Popovich tree because that's uh, that's his. He's sort of the start of that. Just like you know, Mike Holmgren might have a coaching tree, or Andy Reid might have a coaching tree, but they they stem from like the Bill Walsh coaching tree. And so, you know, it's, there's a legacy there. And, and the reason I bring that up is I think it's, number one, it's, it's sort of easier to find some assistance because you've been in good systems and you know guys that are uh, ready for opportunities to step up and, and do bigger things. Um, it doesn't always work out, you know. You know, Emi Adoka, Udoka, like, he, he, again, is a pop guy, a pop guy, and 
Um, it didn't look like it was going to work out at all early in the season, and then he's been phenomenal. Uh, I really do think he's been just tremendous uh, with Boston in the second half of the season. Um, yeah, and so I, the Kings just have to get it right. Like, we're going to keep talking about this, but uh, that's the biggest thing for me. Like, have an exhaustive search. Uh, you know, I think, you know, uh, Monty talked about there's going to be a, what did he say, a comprehensive process. He used language, and I just, when I was reading it, uh, when I was going back and, and pulling his quote, um, it just, like, I don't love uh, a comprehensive and process-driven, process-driven. Like, he, we're using buzzwords here, and, and, like, I don't care about your buzzwords, just get it right. Just get the just get the, the hiring right and, and find a guy that has the ability to capture the imagination of your players. Absolutely. So. I wanna see some players feel like they're being optimized rather than put in an ideal situations. Like a big thing for me is is hiding the weaknesses of role players. And I feel like we haven't seen that very often. Like Buddy Heald, for example, I felt like was asked to do he, he was the example to me of being asked to do more than he probably should. Initiating the offense or there's moments where it's like, why is he the one guarding Devin Booker? Um, and, you know, maybe it's an engagement thing of like, well, but he's actually decent on ball. He tries. It's more so that he's like, okay on ball, but he's horrific off ball. So maybe we should put him on the ball. It's kind of the logic that like, maybe I try to talk myself into, but I think that's the big thing for me is that the stars are going to do what they do, that being Fox and Domas, the role players. Put them in situations where their strengths are highlighted and their weaknesses are hidden. Okay. Um, yeah, I would have uh, – it's funny. Like, you see Buddy go to Indiana, all of a sudden he's averaging seven assists a game or whatever, six assists a game. Like, um, And he will tell you that he was, like, only used as a role player, as a catch-and-shoot corner guy, which isn't the case either. Um, and on ball defense, I, like I, how many times did I watch someone blow by Buddy Heald? Um, like he just was less bad at that as opposed to, you know, like getting back to our cut 14 times a game. And you're like, bro, what just happened? Like, how did that just happen? Like, how did you not make adjustment? And to me, the adjustment, like how did a coach not just say, I can't put you out there anymore to get beat on the back cut again and again? Uh, yeah, so you're right. They need someone who will optimize the, the skill sets of the players in place. Um, I just, you know, you got to make sure you get this one correct and, and let this person uh, grow into their role and, and grow with the team. And it can't just be about this year. It's got to be about, like, bringing this thing forward for the next five years, next yeah. seven years. You need someone who will be here long term. We can talk about continuity when they get it right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, switching out head coaches every two to three years is uh, it, it has not worked. It it, it doesn't work at all. So, um, all right. Uh, do you have any final thoughts? I think that gas numbers changed, and I don't know when. It happened. It's happening. I think so. Oh not no! Sure. Did it go up or down? Uh, or do you not know? No, you I, didn't write it, it down. Actually changed. It hasn't actually changed. Oh, you're just messing with me. I see. Yeah, that's I what see. I would say to the media. There we go. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the King's Beat Podcast. Um, again, we're going to try for next Thursday for the Off the Record with the King's Beat uh, Virtual Happy Hour Part 5 um, from 5.30 to 7.30. That's usually what we do. Um, again, so that's next Thursday, April 21st, I think. Um, I'm just not good with dates uh, ever. Um, so, and we will announce a guest as soon as uh, I have it locked down, but that should be soon. Um, so hopefully uh, we make that announcement quick. Uh, if you're still watching here on uh, the YouTube, uh, give us a th thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, jump on board with the King's Beat. We're doing awesome stuff and we're going to keep going all year long uh more exciting stuff coming more exciting news coming um so stay tuned and uh like thanks for sticking with us this has been a good time uh so for brendan nunez from uh the king's herald and the king's pulse podcast make sure you're watching the king's pulse podcast that's going to be a really good one uh i am james ham 
your Kings Insider for ESPN 1320. And the Kings beat. We'll see you on Tuesday.